you? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, then yeah. then we do one thing uh, due to the time constraint, and uh, I can ask Andreas to speak on the discectomy for recurrence disc herniation. Dr. Andreas, please. Thank you very much, uh, and good evening or good afternoon to everybody. Please let me know if you can hear and see me okay. Yeah, fine. It's okay. okay great. Fine. I'm, I'm very grateful for the invitation, Mehmet and Jati, and of course, I'm also grateful you letting me go first. Due to the time difference, uh, we still have uh, a trauma case to start, and I will be having to go back. So my the request for me was the case for revisional microdiscectomy when we have a recurrent disc herniation, as opposed to a fusion, for example. So I'm going to talk about this concept. I have no disclosures uh, uh, for this. And I'll dive straight in because some of the talks will cover uh, some of the basic concepts. So what are the options? So if we have someone with recurrent disc herniation after already one operation, uh, we can, of course, follow a conservative plan offer pain management with medications, physiotherapy, injections, and so on. Another option is to consider a revisional surgery, and, and, and a common option is a revisional microdiscectomy. That, of course, you can argue can be done standard mini open with a micro technique, or with you, the use of a tube, or with the use of an endoscope, or other things that people are used to in their own departments, but effectively it'll be, it'll be a redo of the first micro approach. A third option is to do the redo micro discectomy, but also supplement that with a fusion. And of course, when we talk about a segmental fusion, there's way too many options uh, to go through in detail, but effectively the concept of fusion will be the extra factor. What are the pros? of the revisional microdiscectomy without fusion. Well, I would argue that we have found an anatomical finding. We have a herniated disc or a disc prolapse, and we're going to address that again. Secondly, we can maintain mobility at that segment. And that is important if someone is a young patient with a lot of physical uh, activities or if they like sports, uh, and if they don't want to, me, to be limited in the flexibility of their lumbar spine. And the third thing to consider is that if we avoid the fusion, we also avoid its potential complications. And these include adjacent segment degeneration and a segment, adjacent segment disease. We avoid a longer operation. We avoid a longer hospital stay. We avoid more blood loss and we avoid a longer recovery. So those are the basic reasons why I would consider a revisional microdiscectomy. Of course, there are caveats, and the caveats are in relation to the patient's characteristics, body mass index, uh, if they smoke or not, uh, some radiological, radiographic factors, how much uh, segmental degeneration is there, the quality of the facets, the end plates, and so on. Another question. What are the cons? You know, we talked about the prones of revisional microscectomy without fusion. What are the cons against this option? Well, we know that sometimes a revisional microdiscectomy approach will probably remove a little bit more bone and undermine the facet a little bit more. So we could potentially destabilize uh, that joint and that segment. And we are are chancing, uh, in other words, allowing the possibility and the risk of a further procedure later on and longer disability. However, this is where I would say, what is really the, the disadvantage in quantifiable terms? Do we know for a fact what is the quantifiable disadvantage of a redo decompression without fusion? And what is the chance of needing a fusion? And again, another question, what is the chance of needing further surgery for adjacent segment disease, not degeneration, adjacent segment disease, if fusion has been performed? So if we do go ahead and go for a fusion, we are then introducing new variables, new biomechanical variables that also predispose 
our patient to potential further procedures. And, and these are the two things which, you know, what are the chances of a further procedure with the decompression alone versus fusion? And that has not been addressed satisfactorily, in my opinion. If we actually go back a step and ask ourselves, what are the risk factors for recurrence? Because if, if we can address the risk factors, maybe we can minimize the risk of recurrence. But uh, recent studies are now trying to employ machine learning and artificial intelligence. I won't go through the details of this, but uh, this is a well-designed uh, machine learning study looked at over uh, 2,000 patients, identified some significant risk factors for reherniation after initial lumbar uh, microdiscectomy, um, but they they do admit that this is only early steps and needs further validation. So I'm going to share, because we only have 10 minutes each for each talk, I'm going to share three important studies. This one from only a handful of five years ago compared the, the incidence, the chance of the index operated level needing a fusion after minimally invasive versus open microdiscectum. And you can briefly catch, cast your eye on the conclusion that says our results suggest a low likelihood of patients ultimately requiring fusion after microdiscectomy, predictors including smoking and history of redo microdiscectomy. Let's look at that in slightly more detail. So the rate of patients after open microdiscectomy or standard microdiscectomy who required later on a fusion was 10% in this small group at an average time of 20 months. On the other hand, if we look at those who had a microdiscectomy via an MIS approach, such as a tubular approach, the rate of index fusion was a bit less at 4% uh, at an average 19 or 20 months. Again, this was not statistically significant. Um, and there was no statistical significance either in the rate of fusion after discectomy between the MIS or open groups. So we're none the wiser here. If we look at the table, looking at the approach and the redo discectomy risk, plus the fusion necessity later, you can see that there is no statistical significance in the p-values. At a different in a different uh, study, admittedly 10 years ago, the differences in the surgical treatment were looked at of recurrent lumbar disc herniation among spine surgeons in the US. Now, arguably, the US setting is not representative of all of us here today, but it is a study that looks at a homogeneous or allegedly a homogeneous single country which in itself shows a huge variation of practice. And therefore, I would expect even more variation amongst ourselves here and worldwide. But the summary is on the right. And you can see here that those who were in practice for 15 years or more, were, in other words, those who were more experienced, were more likely to go for a revisional microdiscectomy rather than a fusion. And those who are doing a bigger volume of operations, 200 or more per year, we're more likely to go for a complicated redo operation with a plif or tilif than those doing fewer surgeries. However, there were no significant differences for region, specialty, fellowship training, or practice type. And their conclusion is there is huge variation in practice, which is reasonable to admit. And finally, if we are now to look at this study, which is more recent, this year. It looks the minimal invasive t lif versus microdiscectomy without fusion for redo disc herniation. It has some strengths. It's a prospective study. It's a comparative study. Uh, but it also has some limitations in that it's only 90 patients, which means about 45 in each group, one group, uh, as I said, a T-leaf, another one, a redo microdiscectomy. 
And if we go to the results, you can see there that the mean total post-operative JOA score across the two groups was not statistically, statistically significantly different. And there was a little bit more back pain in those who had decompression rather than effusion. Uh, but the group with the micro discectomy had higher rates of a dural rupture, postoperative neurological impairment, at the same time, much less blood loss, uh, and, and then some variables on operation times and hospital stay. The conclusion is that recurrent disherniation is effective, but a TLIF would reduce the risk of dural rupture. Of course, when you do a TLIF, your attention is not necessarily only on the decompression. And I would argue that if your aim is to do a redo decompression alone, you do spend more time teasing out the recurrent disc from adherent dura and so on. So the added risk of CSF leak is not hard to understand. So in summary, I would conclude that revisional microdiscectomy is effective. It's fine. If that's what you want to do, it's absolutely fine. There are indeed trends for fusion instead of redo microdiscectomy after uh, a re herniation, but these, in my opinion, lack robust data. And therefore, uh, we should not have a blanket rule to, to fuse everyone with a recurrent disc herniation. And until good quality data becomes available, we should uh, continue to have individual individualized treatment strategies and to consider patient characteristics, our own characteristics, uh, our own uh, likes, dislikes, and strengths and limitations. And of course, the last point I want to make is that in five years, 10 years, 20 years time, we're still going to have this debate rambling on until we as a scientific community tackle it scientifically and not dogmatically with the appropriate well-designed studies. So thank you for your time. and. Uh, Look forward to hearing the other speakers if I can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andreas. It was very nice. And uh, you have uh, given a, a short uh, introduction of uh, the revision surgery with the microsurgical approach. Um, and then the discussion of whether to do a fusion or not. What I personally feel is that we can go ahead with the other talks also so that